So Lord, as we look to your word now, we pray for you to lead us and guide us through this passage because we want to hear from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we'll be in the Gospel of John today in chapter 4. So if you want to follow along in a Bible, that's where we are. If you don't have a Bible and you need one, we have spares on the back table, so you can either feel free to get up and get one or raise your hand, and we will bring one to you in the privacy of your very own seat, wherever you are. Any takers? The lovely and talented Robin is waiting for you if you need one. She's doing the whole game show thing. Okay. So chapter 4, we'll begin in verse 43, but I want to read this first. The stranger approached the pastor after service and said, I'd like you to pray for my hearing. Well, the pastor placed his hands on the man's ears and said a passionate, earnest prayer. When the pastor finished, he removed his hands and asked, How's your hearing now? Well, looking surprised, the man said, Well, I don't know yet. It's not until tomorrow morning down at the courthouse. What I'm really glad about is that Jesus doesn't make these mistakes, okay? He never gets mixed up. So I call this message sign number two. And the reason is because that's what John called it when he wrote it, okay? So verse 43, now after two days, the two days, he departed from there and went to Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also had gone to the feast. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he had heard that Jesus came out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed in his whole household. This is again the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. So starting in 43, after the two days he departed from there and went to Galilee. What two days is John talking about? Well, in context, if you remember a couple weeks ago, <clears throat> this is the two days that Jesus had spent with the Samaritans, what I like to call the hated Samaritans, right? The Jews hated him, but not Jesus, and hopefully his disciples are starting to come around at this point. What did he do? He went to Galilee. Galilee is the region where Jesus grew up. He grew up in Nazareth. Nazareth is in Galilee. Capernaum was his ministry headquarters. Capernaum is in Galilee. So it was a natural thing to go there and next on his list. Besides, Galilee was prophesied as a place of the Messiah. In Isaiah 9, verses 1 and 2, it says, Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when he first lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in the Galilee of the Gentiles. Because the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. So he's talking about Galilee, they're living in the darkness, and they don't mean like living at night or there was no sunshine. Spiritually, of course, is what they're talking about. But they lived in the shadow of death and they lived in darkness. Now they've seen this great light. Is there a greater light in the universe than Jesus? You can say no, he knows that. He agrees. Okay. But not all of Galilee looked at Jesus in a favorable light. Because it says in 44, For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So this verse indicates he probably didn't go directly to Nazareth (laughs) when he went there. And why do I say that? Well, Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. It's a little lengthy, but it says, Then he went out from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. 
And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this, what is given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not all his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. That's amazing. Jesus is teaching, and he's teaching with authority. In fact, I don't know if you know this, most rabbis back then, in fact, all of them would say, Rabbi, this says this, or the Lord says this. Jesus would say, I say this. No one had that kind of authority. Who do you think you are? Plus, they saw him grow up. They watched him play with their kids. They watched him, you know, work as a carpenter, as an adult. So they were offended. They knew his brothers, sisters. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives and in his own house. The Gospels tell us that even Jesus' own brothers didn't believe in him until he rose from the dead. Now, he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. So this is that testimony of Jesus that John's talking about, this section uh, that I just read from Mark. There's a good friend of mine, he used to say that an expert is someone who comes from at least 100 miles away. (laughs) Because if they live near you, they can't be that smart. I don't know what that says about them. (laughs) Like, you know, if you're local, you can't be that smart. Well, then, are you smart? (laughs) You think you're so smart? You live here too. Anyway, the people of Nazareth were very familiar with Jesus. and, And on the surface, that can sound good. I mean, wouldn't it be great to have been familiar with him, to have grown up around him? But there is such a thing as a false familiarity with Jesus. It's a dangerous feeling that we already know all about him. We grew up around him. We saw him do this. We saw him do that. We saw him with bedhead, you know. (laughs) We talked to him and said, hey, go brush your teeth, dude. (laughs) Whatever. He was natural. He was a human being. I mean, you know, took on his God and human at the same time is what I'm trying to say. If we are familiar with Jesus, but we don't recognize that he's God, and don't realize that. It's a dangerous feeling that, l- that leads to a lack of honor for Jesus in our hearts. And we can't have that. We may think of Jesus as a good guy, a good teacher, but not God. But the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus Christ is God. Even Jesus himself said it. So there is that. <laughs> you know, we have that to go by. He called himself God. So 45. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also had gone to the feast. Now the way John worded this, they weren't interested in Jesus as God. They were interested in him as, if I can borrow a movie title, the real greatest showman, okay? In Jerusalem, for the last feast, Jesus had turned the merchant tables over in the outer courts of the table, He also predicted his own resurrection, which means he had to die, too. He performed many, I'm not die yet, but I mean he had to predict his death. And he performed many other signs John didn't even tell us about while he was there. So their attention sounds good, but actually it's sad. Sad because they gave Jesus their attention, but they didn't give him their hearts. And Proverbs 23, 26 says, My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. So Proverbs right there is telling us to give our hearts to God and then look to him, watch him, observe him, learn from him, and then take that learning upon ourselves and act accordingly. So here we see that Jesus went to a specific city in Galilee. Verse 46 tells us it was Cana. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. Remember earlier in John, where he went to the wedding and he changed the water into wine. That was the first miracle he'd ever done. Very good wine, according to the, uh, the, not the president of the feast, you know, the feast master, I guess you could call him, (laughs) the guy in charge. But there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. This certain nobleman means literally a royal person. He was probably an officer in the court of Herod Antipas one of the local governors, king guys. So because you're a nobleman, 
that doesn't mean difficulty will avoid you. The saying that was popular in Jesus' day is still true today. The black camel of grief kneels at every man's gate. Doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, king or pauper, death is coming, sickness is coming, a lot of bad things can happen, things that we view as bad. So verse 47, this nobleman, when he had heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So again, he most likely worked in King Herod's court, and he's probably, because of his position, he's used to getting his own way. And I don't know if you know this about people in power, but a lot of times they get their own way and they don't even have to pay for it. You know what I'm saying? People give them stuff. I remember reading about, I don't know if, you, if the name Kurt Warner is familiar to you, but he played, there are two of them. One played running back for the Seahawks way a long time ago. And then there's another one more recently who played quarterback. He played for the Rams and then eventually the Cardinals and took both of those sad teams to the Super Bowl. And my favorite team is the Rams, so I really like Kurt. But anyway, his wife was telling a story about when they were on food stamps because they could barely get by, but he was still training, thinking he'd make it to the NFL. And everyone was like, give it up, dude. <laughs> it turned out he did. But he was, they were buying steak and things, with these, and people were looking down at him. And then once he made it to the Rams and signed a big contract, then people gave him all kinds of stuff. Like he wore a T-shirt from a Christian company, and within a week there was a box at the door with like 30 T-shirts in it from him. They just sent them to him so he'd wear them. So it, it's that type of thing. I think this nobleman is probably used to getting his own way, and he's not even having to pay for it so often. People will do things without cost for officers of the court in order to win favor with them. But you know what? Sickness is different. Speaking of a football reference, I don't know if you know the name Pat Bolin, but he was the former owner of the Denver Broncos, of the NFL, and he battled Alzheimer's disease for years. And even though he was a billionaire, he still had Alzheimer's, and this past week he died. Sickness does not care who you are. I mean, I'm Pastor Chris. Doesn't the driver of that car know that you shouldn't run over my dog? He was driving. Dog ran in front of him. It happened. You know, things happen to people. I love the, the explanation from Pastor John Corson, and it's kind of harsh toward us. If you feel really good about yourself, like kind of proud of yourself, be prepared to want to punch me in the face. He has the, answers the question, people say, why do bad things happen to good people? You know what his response is? There are no good people. What's amazing is when anything good happens to any of us. That's the surprising part. Now, person to person, comparing, yes, good people, bad people. I won't disagree with that comparison. Some of us are charming, some of us difficult. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Some of us are wonderful. Some people are, they sponge off of everybody and just don't do anything. Other people provide for some, you know what I'm saying? But you compare any of us, the best of us, to Jesus, there is no comparison. None of us is good. In fact, the Bible says, there is none good, no, not one. So, when bad things happen to good people, there aren't any good people. Bad things happen. We live in a sinful, fallen world. And it's, it's a harsh reality, but it's true. Now, you compare that with, think of it's the old hymn, Count Your Blessings. Name them one by one. Well, that's two. But one by one makes two. Anyway, even if you're able to count blessings or try to figure out if you have blessings, that's a blessing right there. Why? Because you're able to think. You're able to think clearly. You're able to lay things out. You're breathing during that process. Your blood is pumping. Your heart is going. Even if your bones ache, your nervous system's working. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There are things you can be thankful for. And every blessing that we have comes from God. Because if you know the Bible, if you know God, if you know you, should you even still be alive? Based on The soul that sins shall... Anybody remember? Die. The Bible says all of us have sinned. Now, I don't know if you know this, but all is a funny word. All means all, 
That's all all means. Every single one of us has sinned. So since all of us have sinned, how many of us have sinned? Go like this if you've ever sinned. Then you deserve death. But the grace of God allows you to live on and live. Even if you're not saved, you can still be living today. But if you want eternal life, you just got to accept him as your Savior and Lord. Ask him to save you. And guess what? He will. Even if you don't feel a thing, even if you don't feel any different, you should. But even if you don't, the Bible says he's going to come into your heart. And then you're under his grace and you're living in his grace. And then, even though bad things happen, you say, well, you know what? I deserve a lot worse. I love a Christian's answer when I ask people, how are you doing? Much better than I deserve. <laughs> Much better. So for this nobleman, no free favor he'd received was working for his son. Nothing was helping. So he became desperate. When he heard that Jesus had come, down out of, or come up out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So he went to Jesus. It probably wasn't the first thing he did, but it was most certainly the best thing he could do. Because it says when he implored, the idea in the Greek is that he begged Jesus to come to his son. Please, 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 please. And have I said please? <laughs> please come. Now, why did he implore him? Why was he nagging him? Because his son was at the point of death. He really needed someone to help his son. A good parent will do whatever it takes to care for their child. You know, they say, don't get between a grizzly bear mama and her cubs. I know a lot of women, you better not get between them and their kids. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm not talking about horrible physical harm, but oh my goodness, wow. They, and it's a natural thing, right, to protect your kids. So this guy's doing the same thing. But we see an interesting response from Jesus. Even when he seems cold and calculating and maybe even mean, he's not. Verse 48, then Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. At first glance, this seems harsh. He, Jesus used the term, you people. You ever watch that in movies where they have like a government agency or even the FBI or whatever, and they're interviewing a suspect, and they talk to him, and he goes, yeah, you people always. It's, it's such a classic thing writers use. You people. Like they already put him in a category. And well, Jesus did the same thing, didn't he? He says, you people. He's checking this guy's heart. He, he knows the guy's heart. He's revealing this nobleman's heart to him is what he's really doing, okay? And he says, you people, unless you see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. But Jesus is right. Wait a minute, what am I saying? Of course he's right. <laughs> he's always right. But by that I mean that there are people who say they need to be shown something in order to believe in God. You show me something, and then I'll believe. In fact, most of us humans are that way. We do it with athletes. We do it with movies, we do it, candidates for office do it, prospective sons-in-law, we want what? We want to sh be shown and then we'll believe. Really, you think you're good enough for my daughter? Show me. <laughs> in fact, there was a famous line in, was it Jerry Maguire? Show me the money! <laughs> the problem with this attitude is, so often if we are shown, we still find a reason not to believe. Or all we want to do is see another sign again and again. But if we simply take Jesus at his word, he says that, and we say, I'm going to believe it, he honors that. And then quite often, he shows us amazing things after we take him at his word. Mostly because he knows we will approach them Excuse me, not approach. I misread this. Mostly because he knows we will appreciate them so much more after we've believed. Compare this statement of the Galileans, what, what Jesus just said to you, unless you see signs, you won't believe, with the reaction of the Samaritans just before in verse 41. And many more believed. Why? Because of his own word. Just what Jesus said. They believed. And that's where genuine faith comes from, hearing God's word and believing it, Romans 10, 17, pretty well-known verse among Christians. So faith comes by hearing, yeah, I wanted to hear it from you, and hearing by what? The Word of God. Not just any old thing, not the ingredients on a hamburger helper box, <laughs> 
but the Bible itself. God says it, we believe it. And you know, God even wants us to be that way. He wants our word to mean what we say. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 37, Let your yes be yes, and your no be no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one, the devil, Satan. You know, you ever seen people that say, I swear on a stack of Bibles, that's the truth. Does that mean most of the other time you're talking, you're not telling the truth? <laughs> I mean, you know, we have, a, we have a, a kind of a common saying for that. I can tell that guy's lying. Why? His lips are moving. <laughs> it's like you can't trust some people with what they say. We should be very trustworthy with what we say. Yes, we're going to promise things and not come through. Our attire will blow out. We'll oversleep. We don't mean to do it. We forget. But it isn't a deliberate thing. It should never be, oh, I said I'd do that. Well, that doesn't matter. No, it does matter. God always comes through. We should work at doing that too. Whatever Jesus says, though, we can believe him because he always tells the truth. And I love this from Numbers. This is an Old Testament thing. How about that? Numbers 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? You see, everything God says is true. His word is all true. Even the parts about our sin, about our need for a Savior, about his forgiveness, his acceptance of us when we do repent, his great love for us, his promise of eternal life, all promises he made to us in his word we have to learn that we can take him at his word. There's that hymn, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Remember the next line? Just to take him at his word. You can. Now, we all know people, no matter what they say, you go, right. Like, I'll see you Tuesday. That'd be nice. <laughs> I'll be happy if I do. But if Jesus were to say, I'll see you Tuesday, you're going to see him Tuesday. Even when the storm came up on the, the Sea of Galilee, what did he say before they got in the boat? Let's get in the boat, go to the other side. Did he say, let's get in the boat, go to the middle and drown in a horrible storm? No. Let's get in the boat and go to the other side. Now, if they'd remembered that, they'd go, I think we're going to die. But he said we're going to make it to the other side. So even if we die, he's going to resurrect us. We're good. Let's just trust him. <laughs> that requires a lot of faith, right? It really does. Because I've been out in boats and storms, and it can be frightening. But he always comes through on his promises. We have to learn to trust him. Take him at his word. But even after what Jesus said, that seemed like it might have been snide, the nobleman said this. He persisted. Sir, please come down before my child dies. You see, here we see the heart of this father. He came to Jesus, as we all should all the time, and he gave Jesus a blanket statement condemning the show-me attitude. Or Jesus gave him, excuse me, the, the blanket statement condemning the show-me attitude. You guys, you just want to see miracles. But though no one doesn't quit. He may not understand all of what Jesus says, but he knows and he believes that he can heal his son. And that's what he came for. So he asks him to do it. But Jesus isn't finished building this man's faith. He's got more to go. Jesus, in verse 50, said to him, Go your way, your son lives. Now, that's interesting because Jesus didn't go with him to his house, which is what the guy asked, right? Come with me, my son's dying. He says, go your way, your son lives. He did not go and heal his son. Now, we have other accounts when Jesus did go and heal people. Here he simply said, go your way, your son lives. Now, we have the advantage of perspective. We have other Bible verses we can turn to that support the claims of Jesus. We know Jesus can be trusted with what he says. We know that if Jesus says it, it's going to happen. But what about this nobleman guy? Oh, we don't even know his name. <laughs> they, John 
specifically by the direction of the Holy Spirit, didn't give us his name, the man who most likely worked in the household of King Herod Antipas, it seems as though he might be inclined to believe in the false gods his king trusted, to go along with society and discount what this carpenter from Nazareth turned itinerant preacher says. After all, most of the Jewish leaders rejected him, so why shouldn't he, but not this nobleman? So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. Now, Jesus isn't quoted as saying it here, but at least three other times Jesus said to those whom he healed, your faith has made you well. The simple fact that they believed Jesus made it possible for him to work. And it's the same thing with this nobleman. Jesus said, go your way, your son lives. And it's as if Jesus said, your faith has healed your son. And that was good enough for this nobleman. Now, now when we read a promise in the Bible, especially a promise that applies to us and to our situation, do we believe the words that it says to us? Or do we doubt? Or even worse, do we harbor unbelief in our hearts? I want to say this to all the saints of God here. And if you're a believer in Jesus, you are a saint. I don't go along with what the Catholic Church teaches, that you have to, first of all, be dead to be a saint, because you all are breathing, so you're not dead. The Bible calls us saints. We are. Listen to this. If God says it, it's true. Learn it. Know it. Believe it. Live it. It's all true. Now we'll see how completely this nobleman believed the words of Jesus. John says he believed him. We'll see how much. Verse 51, And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. First of all, yay, this is such good news. (laughs) And they don't mean your son lives like he's dragged on through another day. Have you brought help? (laughs) That isn't what they mean. This is the very reason he went to see Jesus. So verse 52, then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. Why? What does that matter? Who cares when? He's just healed. But this nobleman knows that something miraculous happened here. Something only God could have done. And he didn't slowly get better. It was bam. All of a sudden he was fine. So he asks his servants a very important question. When did he get better? It's almost like he's like, aha, he got better, but when did he get better? (laughs) That's what I want to know. So verse, and then they go on in 52, and they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. Now, there are a couple things to note here. First, when did the fever leave his son? Yesterday at the seventh hour. So the first key is yesterday. Now, the distance in miles from Cana where Jesus was, and Capernaum, where the nobleman's son was, was about 16 and a half miles or so, which is about, based on about 2.75 miles per hour, it's about a six-hour walk for a healthy person. Now, if you're in a hurry, as the father of a sick son might be, to see if his son was healed, you could probably cut that time down. So depending on the time of day, he may have been able to make it home that same day. But he didn't. He waited till the next day. Look at the beginning of verse 51. And as he was now going down, he waited to go home. There's only one explanation for this. He believed Jesus completely. Oh, he's better? You know, it's kind of late. I think I'll go over to Goldstein's fish stand, have some dinner, and head down tomorrow. He acted accordingly. He was fine. But he did begin the journey home. He simply waited till the next day. And along the way, maybe close to his house, the servants met him. Now, why were they coming? Because his son is going to live and they wanted him to know. Now, the second thing to look at, they told him he got better at the seventh hour. Why is that so important? Well, let's look in verse 53. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. The exact same time. As soon as Jesus said, your son lives, he got better. Now, was Jesus there 
Was he anointing him with oil? Was he singing, with healing in my wings, I'm Jesus, the King of Kings? No, he, he, (laughs) it's an old song. You'd have to know the song. It's a great one for praying for somebody who's sick, but it doesn't mean that God's going to act just because the way you want him to, just because you sing that song. Because God doesn't fit in the -the jack-in-the-box thing. Pop goes the Savior, you know. (laughs) I even wrote a little song about it, but I won't get into it now. So, Jesus is in Cana. The sick son is in Capernaum. All he has to do is say, your son lives. Healed over there. That's amazing power. And this guy's faith is being built. All this does to hear about the seventh hour, he's like, it just made his faith even stronger. It built up his faith. You see, he believed, then he saw, and what he saw built up his faith. Because seeing a miracle for a miracle's sake would just make you want to see the next one. You know, if I never saw another miracle in my life, I would still believe in God. But seeing miracles strengthens the faith that you already have. If your faith is built on seeing wonder after wonder after miracle after sign, you'll never have enough signs and wonders to have a saving faith. But if your faith is built on the Word of God, then you will not only have a great faith, but you will live a life of great faith. Because all you do is simply believe God, which is coincidentally all he asks us to do. Acts 27, 25. The Apostle Paul, was they were about to be shipwrecked. But God told him, no one's going to die. You're going to lose the boat. But no one's going to die. Paul says, therefore take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. I put that in your notes, Acts 27, 25. You might want to circle that, highlight it, go to your Bible, highlight it, underline it. If you're a writer in there, draw arrows toward it and then believe it. Take heart, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. It should be one of our life verses, really. So now we'll see how this healing of this Jesus did of this uh, nobleman's son, how it affected the nobleman. And he himself believed and his whole household. I think this nobleman had already believed Jesus. That's why it happened. The the healing happened. But it only strengthened his faith, and it strengthened it to the point where he became an evangelist for Jesus. And it started his ministry. He started his ministry in his own home. Now, here's the hammer in the father's part, the mini part, okay? It's not really hammering. But fathers, dads, on this Father's Day, remember this your family is much more likely to follow Jesus, to believe in Jesus as Savior and Lord, if you follow Jesus too. If you lead the way, show them your faith. Read the Bible in your home. Live the Bible in your life. Read the Bible to them. I tell you, my kids, I've shared this story before, but I love it so much, and a lot of you haven't heard it. But my kids, like a lot of kids, this is before video games, before the turn of the century, (laughs) when they was youngins, they would go down the street, and I would always go outside, and I won't do it because it would blow out the speakers, but I'd whistle, my super loud whistle, and they knew my whistle, they'd come home. They didn't come home. Like, that's weird. Must be inside down in the kids' basement, you know, which they did, and they wouldn't hear it down there. So I walked down there and knocked on the door. They came out, and they were walking, we were walking home, just the three of us, or four of us, three kids. So it was four of us. And they were talking about how their friends were mean to them. And I said, what do you mean? And they told me, and they were being pretty mean based on what you know, the three witnesses were telling me. And I said, well, you have to understand something. As they were walking, I said, their parents, where's their dad? Well, he's over in Portland, right. Are they still married? No. They got a divorce, right? Right. Where's your dad? Uh, right here with us. <laughs> you. Where's your mom? At home. She made dinner. She's just waiting for us, right? Right. So you see, what we have, they will never have again. And we still have it. Mom, dad, married to each other, in love with you, loving you. They'll never have that. So they're, they're lashing out because they're angry at their situation and they're taking it out on you. So you have to show them extra love because the Bible says, this is one of those teachable moments in life. 
do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Their being evil just lavish more good on them. And you know what's weird? They're still friends with those kids today. The Bible works, folks. It really does. So if you're leading the way, now listen, I was not Captain Scripture every day, okay? I made horrible mistakes as, as a parent. And I'm not going to get into them because I want you to think that I am Captain Scripture. But when, those moment, when I allowed God to work through me, it was so amazing how the results were, okay? So that, that's about the most amount I'm going to get on it. Because your kids will notice, and they'll remember what you showed them, both by reading Scripture to them and by living Scripture out in front of them. Remember Proverbs 22.6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. One more NFL reference, Mike Singletary. <laughs> yeah, I got a yeah from a Bears fan. <laughs> Probably the second best middle linebacker. Sorry, Dick Butkus is pretty good too. He's before your time. But anyway, <laughs> like they said about Dick Butkus, his, enemy, his enemies, his, for, some of the Packers said, he came after you like he hated you from his old neighborhood. I mean, <laughs> that's how Dick Butkus was. But anyway, Mike Singletary, born-again Christian, as fiercely as he played, they had a picture of him in a Christian sports magazine, and it was like a centerfold, a picture of him playing. And the quote was, the most important thing I can teach my kids is to love Jesus Christ. And I thought, wow, this guy is the baddest man on the planet, in the NFL anyway, and he says, got to teach my kids about Jesus, not about football, not about this, not about that, making money. No, teach them to love Jesus. I thought that was great. I thought that was an amen moment. So, verse 54, this again is the second sign Jesus did while he had come out of Judea into Galilee. So, John tells us specifically that Jesus did this miracle as a sign. So, why did John include this? First of all, to give me a sermon title today. But actually, the first reason is the Holy Spirit led him. But the second one, I believe, is this. What John wrote at the end of his gospel in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. And we're like, why? I want to know more. <laughs> Here's what he said. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. John wrote his gospel so people would get eternal life. That's why he wrote it. So teach your family members that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And then you pray for them. And my prayer is that they'll come around and they will thank you later, even if they don't now. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this great message. Thank you for the heart of this father who went 16, 17 miles away to talk to a guy who was traveling around whom he believed could heal his son. And I thank you for Jesus, obviously, but specifically in this case, that he kind of drew that faith out of that man and showed him who he is, and he believed. And then not only that, but he became an evangelist, and his whole household believed, because he led by example. And they saw a great wonder. How did he get better? The man I went to see healed him. He wasn't even here. I know, right? <laughs> so amazing, God. So thank you. And I pray, Lord, that all the dads here would have a great Father's Day and that um, we just look forward to your coming. But until then, I pray that we would live out your word in our daily lives. In Jesus' name, amen.